today I'm going to share tips of how to memorize the ion identification tests. I'm also going to make connections with other related topics such as acids and bases, the solubility rules, and the periodic table. The material is suitable for IGCSE O-level chemistry, A-level, and IB students. A lot of students have problems memorizing this list because they are not learning it the right way. I suggest that you study the list by small sections. It's important not to cram information, doesn't matter what you are learning. Take a break be between sessions and if necessary, learn one section in the morning and another in the evening and then continue the next day. Every time you are ready to study a new section, always actively recall the previous section that you have learned. You can do this by pretending that you teach someone else the tests and the explanation for the tests. The why and the how are important. After this review, then you can add on to your knowledge by learning a new section. It helps to retain new information if you can make connections with related and supporting topics that you have learned previously. This is why in the video, I use concepts from acid base, redox to provide those connections. Last but not least, it's crucial to practice because it provides an opportunity for you to apply your knowledge. And this is best by actually doing experiments, practice with past practical exam papers to identify given ions. You can also practice with questions about ion identification. For our discussion today, I'm using this list from IGCSE Paper 5 because it contains most of the required ion tests in other syllabi. While there are different reagents used for testing anions, notice that there are only two used in cation tests, sodium hydroxide and ammonia. This means if you are asked to identify cations of unknown salt solutions, you need to use sodium hydroxide and ammonia as the reagents. You only need to learn the expected observations of the ions. We learn best in small chunks, and it's the same with learning this list. Therefore, I have divided the list into smaller sections and will go through each section with you. The first section is the halides. We have chloride, bromide, and iodide, which are in descending order in group 7 or 17 in the periodic table. They are tested using the same reagent, which is silver nitrate solution. However, before silver nitrate is added, nitric acid needs to be added into the sample solution to get rid of any carbonate impurities because carbonates give the same results as halides, and this lead to a, an incorrect conclusion. One observable trend of the halogen is that when you go down the group, the color of the elements get darker. This is true for the color of the precipitate formed in the test as well. Silver chloride is white, silver bromide is cream, and silver iodide is yellow. When you check the precipitate color, always check it against a white background to help distinguish the faint colors, such as between cream and white. The next section is nitrate and ammonium ions. Find the similarities between the two tests. They both use sodium hydroxide, they involve warming, and in both cases, ammonia is produced. I'm going to address this question soon. How is ammonium com converted to ammonia? But before that, to help you remember, look at the list again. Ammonia is NH3. And notice that 
The only two ions that contain nitrogen in this list are nitrate and ammonium. Back to this question. How can ammonium be converted to ammonia? If you look at the images carefully, you may suggest that hydrogen plus must be eliminated from ammonium ion, and you'd be right. The question is, what reagent would accept hydrogen ion? It would be a base, and sodium hydroxide is a strong base. Hydrogen and hydroxide ions react to form water. The next section is tests for carbonate, sulfate, and sulfite. All of them use acids as one of the reagents. Carbonates react with any acid to give carbon dioxide, which is observed as fizzing or bubbles. Sulfates are mostly soluble except with a few ions, including barium. And that's why barium nitrate is used to test for the presence of sulfate. But before barium nitrate is added, nitric acid must be added first to get rid of any carbonate impurities because it will give the same result as the sulfate. Now look at sulfate and sulfite. If sulfate can be reduced to sulfite, sulfite can be oxidized to sulfate. Something that is oxidized is referred to as a reducing agent. Remember the test for a reducing agent? We must use an oxidizing agent to test for a reducing agent such as acidified potassium manganate 7, which is a very strong oxidizing agent. Manganese with oxidation state of plus 7 is purple, whereas plus 2 is colorless. This test also gives a positive result for other reducing agents such as nitrite, which gets oxidized to nitrate upon the addition of acidified potassium manganate 7. So, for a more specific test for sulfite ion, we can add hydrochloric acid to sulfite. This reaction produces sulfur, uh, sulfur dioxide gas. Sulfur dioxide can be oxidized to sulfur trioxide, so it acts as a reducing agent. And remember the test for a reducing agent? It's acidified potassium manganate 7, but this time, instead of testing the solution, we test the gas. The next block that I'm going to address is the transition metal ions. A lot of transition metal ions form colored compounds, like gems. These contain transition metal ions. Chromium-3, Copper-2, Iron-2, and Iron-3 all form insoluble precipitate with sodium hydroxide and ammonia except these two tests. Chromium-3 with excess sodium hydroxide and Copper-2 with excess ammonia. Notice that Iron-2 hydroxide, which is green precipitate, turns brown at the surface. This is because iron 2 gets oxidized to the more stable iron 3. And the color of iron 3 is, of course, brown or red-brown. It's the color of rust, which is just hydrated form of iron 3 hydroxide. The solubility rule says that most hydroxides are insoluble, including chromium-3 hydroxide. But because chromium-3 hydroxide is empoteric, it can further react with excess hydroxide to form a soluble complex ion. Again, the solubility rule says that copper-2 hydroxide is insoluble. When ammonia is added to copper-2 solution, the insoluble 
copper hydroxide is produced. Just in case you are wondering where the hydroxide ion is from, ammonia is a weak base, it reacts with water and they partially dissociate into ammonium and hydroxide ion. Now copper 2 hydroxide can react with excess ammonia to produce a soluble complex ion which is deep blue in color. This section is on non-transition metal ions, which do not form colored compounds. So all of the precipitate formed here are white. The only test that does not form a precipitate is calcium with ammonia, and we'll get to that in a minute. Aluminium hydroxide is insoluble, but just like aluminum oxide is empathetic which means aluminum hydroxide can further react with excess hydroxide to form a soluble ion. That's why it dissolves in excess sodium hydroxide. However, ammonia is not a strong enough base to bring out the empathetic properties of aluminum hydroxide. The explanation for zinc ion is similar to that of aluminum ion. Zinc hydroxide is insoluble, but just like zinc oxide, it's empathetic, which means zinc hydroxide can further react with excess hydroxide to form a soluble ion. The only difference here is that because zinc ion can form a soluble complex with ammonia, Therefore, zinc hydroxide dissolves in excess ammonia. Calcium is a little different because calcium hydroxide is actually slightly soluble in water. And that's why we can get clear colorless calcium hydroxide solution, which we refer to as lime water. When there is a high concentration of hydroxide ion, such as in sodium hydroxide, there will be a lot of calcium hydroxide produced. So a lot of it will precipitate out. But with only very low concentration of hydroxide, such as in ammonia solution, there will be only a little bit of calcium hydroxide produced and almost all of it will dissolve in water. So there is no visible change when ammonia is added into a solution of calcium ion. And at most, all you're going to get is very slight white PPT. Thank you for watching. Please hit like and subscribe button.